Hi guys, and thank you for tuning in for another episode of Third Culture Africans. Our guest this week is Helen Habila, who has found a way of poetically sharing fictional stories in a way that's quite unique. I found Helen to be incredibly honest and passionate about his journey, his work, and with a calming sense of self-belief that has underpinned his journey so far. I hope you enjoy this episode as much as I did sitting down and chatting with Helen. Welcome to another episode of Third Culture Africans. I am your host, Zezo Oriaki Sal. I created the show as a resource for our community of Africans and African diaspora. A safe and honest place to share, inspire, motivate, and most importantly, celebrate those in our communities doing purposeful work and shifting the needle on our culture. Your support is invaluable to the show, so please subscribe or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and leave us a review on your favorite streaming platform. You are valid, you are strong, and you are just getting started. Thanks, Helen, for joining us on this week's episode of Third Culture Africans. It's a pleasure having you on, and I'm excited to kind of dive into this week's episode with you, talking about your journey. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. You're a multi-award winning poet, writer, literary educator, professor, and editor, and scholar. Ding, ding, ding. (laughs) (laughs) Would that be a, a, a good description? Have I left anything out? No. Sounds like me. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds a lot, right? <laughs> when someone says it back. Yeah. So I guess j- just to, to tap into, I guess, early days, you were born in Nigeria and studied English language. English and literature, yeah. How was that as a decision at the time? Like in, in your mind, what were the career prospects going into study English language and literature? Or did you already have a love for telling stories? Yeah, I had a love for telling stories, definitely. But my... My career path, according to my father, you know, my father as a typical Nigerian, you know, wanted me to be an engineer, actually. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So literature and English was like the farthest thing from the options. How did you get away with that? Yeah, I had a very rough, long journey. I actually went to university to read engineering and I got kicked out after one, two years, because my mind was not there. I was not paying attention. Basically, I wasn't even going to classes. This is at the University of Joss or somewhere else? No, before Joss. This was Tefa Abaliwa University in Bauchi. So I was in ATBU, Hoboken Tefa Abaliwa College. And so you were an absconder, you were skiving classes. I was an absconder. <laughs> my mind was totally not there, all the math and physics. So I just, I just couldn't handle it. I was always in my room reading novels and um, hanging out with my friends, um, you know, watching movies. What did that do for, I guess, your mood? Because I think often we don't talk about what happens when you find yourself in a position where you're you don't have the passion and you don't have the drive and yet you're supposed to turn up and be your best self. It depends on your personality. You know, there are some people who could go through with it, you know, without any passion, but they'll, they'll do it. And that's a recipe for disaster because <laughs> you might just end up one day just kind of coming out screaming because it's too much. So for me, I'm not that kind of person. If I'm not interested in it, I really won't even try. It has to be something that I really am passionate about. That's the way to get me going. If I'm passionate, regardless of how hard it is, you know, how impossible, I will still give it a go and I'll keep going. That's where I operate. So it's about the love for the thing. So year two, you get kicked out? I got kicked out, went back home. My father almost had a fit. (laughs) What are you doing here? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. My father couldn't believe it because I was like an above average student. You know, I was basically one of the best students. And my teachers in secondary school used to come and tell my father, that, wow, your son is so good. And to kind of go back a little further, I don't know if you remember in Nigeria at the time, if you are just above average, anywhere above average, they will send you to science secondary school because we had these two systems, art secondary schools and science secondary schools. I don't know if they still have the same system, but at that time, I I finished secondary school in 1984, so that was a long time ago. So at that time, they had the dual system of art and sciences, and anyone that's just slightly good, they just send you to science, because there was this program encouraging people to read sciences and to produce scientists. It's quite binary, right? It was either a one or a zero at the time. Yeah, 
basically that's it. So I was always above average in all the subjects. And then, so that was their cue to send me to a science secondary school. So that's how I ended up going to science secondary school and graduating with a, you know, fairly good um, GCE result and then going to university. So now here I was back home to skip forward. And I told my father I really didn't want to do sciences. And I decided to redo my jump exam. So I had to sit down and read the art syllabus on my own, literature, history, and all the other, which I didn't do in secondary school. I had to read them, you know, at home on my own in my bedroom. And I did that. I was home for about two years. So I had lost about four years now before I went wow. back to university. Yeah. So you're now also dealing with the social pressure of your mates, as it were. Yeah, my mates were actually graduating. Yeah, my mates were graduating. And here I was just starting. I got my admission to University of Jaws, which was my first choice. And I went in for English. And so you arrive in Joss. Is it, what? why didn't I do this sooner? Or are you thinking, oh my God, this is a lot to make up? I was just happy to be there, to be honest. I, I didn't care, you know, about the time wasted. Of course, it was always at the back of my mind. You know, I knew there was this pressure that I had to, I can't afford to waste any more time. You can't afford to sleep up. But I wasn't going to sleep up because that was, I was there. That was my thing. Did you know at this point you wanted to be a writer? Oh, yeah. I had been reading, I had actually written a novel at home while I was at home waiting to come back to university. I was reading like crazy. I would be in my room basically reading from morning to night, reading novels. My mother would have to come and tell me, why don't you go out, hang out with your friends? She was getting worried for me because... <laughs> <laughs> you were becoming antisocial. I would just read novels. Head Not in a book novels, all the time. But actually, mm-hmm. you know, be making notes from the novels, you know, analyzing character and things like that. So I knew... And I was writing poems. and. But were you open about that knowledge? Or, or is this something you were kind of keeping close to your chest because you weren't sure how you would be able to, to succeed doing that? Was I open about it to my parents or to my friends? My friends knew, but I didn't tell my parents exactly. My parents didn't go to university. So the concept of me becoming a writer wasn't even something they would understand. I had never met an author And even among my friends, you know, to say that I was going to be a writer would be like saying you want to be an astronaut. You know, it's like, you know, who who does that? So it was just an ambition that I kind of nursed on my own and kind of making it up as I go along. So I didn't find any serious encouragement until I went to university. Then I met my professors who were authors themselves, um, English teachers. And here I was then finally you know, among people who are like me. And I had classmates who were also poets who saw nothing odd, you know, in aspiring to become a writer. So I could be myself. Finally, I could speak about these things that I'm passionate about. And I just started. And I was lucky one of my short stories got published in my second year at university. So that was a kind of very good validation that I could do this. Was the dream as big as what you've achieved then? Like I said, it was like grasping in the dark, you know, I couldn't even realize the size of the dream or where it might lead to. All I had to do was just, you know, take the next step and the next step and and just try to be the best I could be. But my teachers were telling me, you know, you are really good in this. You should really believe in it and push yourself and keep doing it. You know, you might actually get to publish a book one day. That was how it went. And one thing that happened, I told you I was writing stories when I was at home waiting to go to university. So it was one of those stories that got published when I was at university because I sent it out before I went to university. I sent it out. I didn't even know they were going to accept it or it was going to get published. So it was published in an anthology. And as it turned out, some of my professors also had their stories in that same anthology alongside mine. And we actually ended up studying my short story in class. One of my professors recommended it. Incredible. For us. <laughs> Incredible. Okay, if that's not validation, I don't know what else is. And so you take that, you finish your undergrad degree, and then you move to Lagos, right? The big city. No, nope, I didn't move to Lagos. It was not as smooth and fast as that. There was there was always hurdles. <laughs> <laughs> yes, give me the in-between, the gray, the gray bits. <laughs> Yeah, I moved to Bauchi. I'm from Gombe State. Gombe used to be part of Bauchi State. So Bauchi was the state capital at that time. And I went to teach at the Federal Polytechnic Bauchi after my NYC. So I was there for a couple of years teaching English and right, working on my novel. So you're teaching secondary school students now in no, English? No, Polytechnic. Federal Polytechnic. So these Bauchi. are tertiary education? Yeah, it's students. like university. Amazing. Just a technical university. Yeah. yeah. So I was there working on my novel, very unhappy because 
here I was again without people like myself who I could talk to and and I knew I didn't have much of a future in that place. You know, it's a beautiful place, but it was not like a cultural It wasn't place. the literary capital of, of, exactly. of the world at the exactly. time. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No book clubs, no authors to hang out with, and basically no libraries where I could buy, um, get books to read. The only library was this mobile library, British Council. They used to come there once every month, and you could borrow eight books at once. So that was my lifeline. That was the only thing keeping me going there. But I'm sure at the at the time you're reading more than eight books in a week. Or, you know. I was reading like mad. That was the only thing I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> it was like food. You come yeah. to my room and you see me like with five books in front of me, all of them open. I'll go from one book to the next, to the next. Read one chapter here, one chapter there. I feel like a lot of poets and writers do that. They They read multiple books at the same time. Yeah. You know, you're impatient. You want to drink it. You know, it's, it's like food. You want to eat it up. So, you know, to cut a long story short, after two years, I got a job offer in Lagos to work for Hints Magazine. A friend of mine from university, his name is Tony, Tony Khan, invited me. He was working for Hints Magazine at the time. And I packed my bag the next, the next day. I was, I was gone. I didn't even resign from my job. I just, I, I just left. <laughs> <laughs> See you later at dusk. Yeah. So Hints being a lifestyle publication, you would then write what sort of stories? Interviews or fiction? stories or short stories fiction romance believe it or not romance stories <laughs> yeah the magazine is known for romance stories you know we call it true life stories you know kind of crazy weird romance stories oh my my husband is having an affair you know that kind of those kind of stories oh my stepmother doesn't like me or likes my boyfriend um things like that okay this podcast is sponsored by Malay Natural Science. Malay's products are inspired by the rich landscapes, alluring scents, and ancient wisdom of Africa. Their luxurious fragrance and body care range balances 100% natural active ingredients and scientifically proven formulas to heal, protect, and pamper your skin. Malay ships worldwide, and you can buy their products at maleeonline.com. They also offer a free sample if you'd like to try. I do have a question around your work and I was one of the questions I had around it was woven through your work there's something very strong around time and and I was going to say there was something romantic about the way you write so interesting that the, the stinted hints explain romantic I guess your lens is is very romantic okay non realistic no, 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 no. Romance can be realistic. It, it does exist, okay. right, in real life. But just the way you write, you know, boy meets girl, the way the story develops is is almost in the way that you'll expect. Love stories, yeah. Yes. I love good love stories. Yeah, and as a reader, you get drawn into the emotion too, even though you, you write very far away from like romance, but it kind of alludes to that in the way that you put together the narrative. But I digress. Let's let's go back to the early days. So, yeah, but, but it's a good point. And if you don't mind, you know, just to say that I, I believe it's one of the strongest emotions, you know, for humans to be loved and to be appreciated. And as a writer, you are looking for that strong emotion to move your story forward. What is it that moves people? If you can get that, if you can capture that in your novel, and make your reader feel it and see it and empathize with it. It makes the story kind of easy to follow and to lose oneself in. So I always use that. And I think most of the greatest writers always have that, from Shakespeare to J.M. Kutzia to even Achebe, you have that. It's part of who we are. Yeah, it's underpinned somewhere in all of our great stories of the world. So you do hints and you take hints and then what comes next after hints? Yeah, so at hints I was working on my novel and my show, and my poems and I won a poetry competition. That was like the biggest in the country at that time. It's called the Muson Poetry Prize. Is the music Muson is M-U-S-O-N. Music Society of Nigeria. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was like really big, really huge. I think the prize money was 50,000 naira at the time. That was like $50,000. Yes, because it was one-to-one. That's a lot of money as a young guy. As a young guy in Lagos with nothing to do. So that was huge, huge encouragement for me. It was finally, you know, the validation. Is this your first I made it moment? I think so. You could call it that. 
that was it that I knew because I wasn't just competing with guys in Bauchi or university. This was the whole country. This was an open competition. And to come first was, yeah, I can do this. So that, that encouraged me to really focus on my novel and finish it. And I finished my novel and I left Hint magazine and I moved to Vanguard newspaper. This time it's a proper newspaper. That was like the fourth largest newspaper in Nigeria at the time. And I was the arts editor. Incredible. So hold on, you've gone from struggling Hint's romance writer at this point. <laughs> like, let's paint <laughs> the a picture. a real journalist. <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, let's paint the picture to winning $50,000, which sets you up, like, which creates a new platform for your life personally, to now becoming a journalist at one of the largest magazines in the country. Newspapers, yeah. Newspapers, and now respected for his work. Or hadn't that arrived yet? No, I was, I was, I think I was respected. I was admired. You have to understand the context too, in which I was doing this. This was 1990, just after the dictatorship. So we were just coming out of this very dark, very bleak moment when writers were almost always looked at suspiciously by the government. They were arrested. A lot of them went into exile. A lot of them were killed. So there was this huge dark time for writers. And and I think to paint the picture, right, so the the wave of influence was sort of the transition from colonialism was first music, and then after that was literature, so books and novels, writing. And so, you know, that period was as good as becoming a, you know, a music artist of today, right, a a whiz kid or whoever. Like everyone read those books, they were studied at school. There was also the economic depression because the military government had totally run the economy into the ground and there was no publishing as you know it today. Most of the publishing companies that you see today that are flourishing in Africa, they came after the 1990s, like late 1990s. So imagine no publisher, nothing. You couldn't send your manuscript to a publisher. They had pulled out because they couldn't make any money. The exchange rate was too much for them to import a newsprint and to publish books and sell it and make a profit. So all the multinationals, Macmillan, Africa Writer Series, they had pulled out and there was no indigenous local publisher publishing. So the only way to publish a book was to self-publish. And that was what I did when I finished my novel. And finally, I had to send it to a printer and you pay the money. I think I printed about 500 copies of my book. And the book is called Prison Stories. And you can imagine why I call it Prison Stories. Yes. Because, you know, basically all my friends that I knew, a lot of them were in prison. Writers that we admired, that dared to speak out, were in prison or in exile. So I wanted to capture the, the worldview of a young person like myself who felt very stifled by what was happening, by the political reality of the time, yes, by the milieu. So I published my book and I had nothing to do with it. I mean, I could do nothing with it. I couldn't sell it. I couldn't. That's the problem with self-publishing. You cannot distribute it. That was going to be one of my questions, which is, you know, we're now in the age of Amazon. Anyone can have their voice heard. There's Twitter, there's Instagram, there are all these mediums of sharing your voice. But how easy is that now? compared to to then. But I I love that you've just touched on, I guess, your challenge with self-publishing. Yeah, one takes all these things for granted now. I'm trying to explain this to a young person now. It would be, you know, imagine before the internet. Yeah. (laughs) Imagine before Amazon. Imagine there were no agents waiting to, to accept your manuscript. We didn't even have email addresses. So at this point, is your concern that for the publishers that were left, anything potentially political or potentially aggravating in a political sense was almost life-threatening, right? Like you could go to jail for it. Oh yeah. This was just after the Abacha regime. So now we've moved into democracy, but just a few years, a couple of years before that, you could get arrested for doing all these things, the things that we take for granted, for writing an article in the newspapers, publishing a poem, talking about the government, all these things. So this was, sorry, this was late 1990, 2000, because I think dictatorship ended in 1998. Obasanjo came into power around 1998. But but I guess on, on the ground, things were still relatively slow to reach all industries, right? This ushering of a new dawn in democracy 
democracy still hadn't necessarily kicked in to the level that it's at today. Oh, yeah. No, far, far, far from where they are today. The only things we could do then was to hang out together as writers in Lagos. And Lagos was cultural capital of the country. So there were the Writers Association, Authors Association and Penn International chapters. And, you know, sometimes British Council would organize events. So those were the places where we would go and hang out and talk about literature and give readings and critique each other. It used to be this tight, neat community of writers. So we all knew each other. And of course, as journalists on the cultural page, we also had that those um, communities. And that was so that, that was how I distributed my books, basically giving it to friends at this event, you know, free of charge. I couldn't sell them. <laughs> I was giving them out so people could read them. You know, that was a joy for me to be read. So it didn't matter that all that mattered to you was that someone read it. Someone read it, talk about it and tell me, you know, yeah, we appreciate it. You know, we think um, it's good. That was all we're doing. Basically, people who write their poems on a piece of paper and then pass it around and we'll read it and talk about it, you know, and critique each other. Yeah. Did the feedback matter? Feedback matters, always does. Appreciation matters. You know, like Shakespeare said, our praises are our wages. You know, it's like you're being paid <laughs> by being praised. That was it. We were not even doing it for money. We couldn't even think of selling them. Not that we wouldn't want to sell them, you know, but who would buy them? So it was, you know, just something that you wrote, a labor of love, if you like. I and love that. I love that. Who would buy it? In <laughs> hindsight, it. that sounds a bit weird, right? True. Considering how many thousands and thousands of copies of your work you sold, who would buy it? Question mark. Yeah. So that was how it was. So you take that and then Love Poems comes after. Love Poems is a chapter in the book. So that's the first chapter of that book. The book is kind of interlinked stories. Each one is kind of autonomous chapter. So I saw an advertisement for a competition, the Kane Prize in London, and I decided to send the first chapter of the book for the competition. It was a kind of Africa-wide competition. They wanted a short story of about um, 5,000 words and has to be in English, something like that. And it has, so the only problem for me at the time was the competition you had to be entered for by the publisher, not by the author. The premise was they wanted to save the author all the trouble. So it had to be, the cost of entering the competition had to be borne by the publisher. Yeah. And I guess it limited the pool of entries at the time, right? Because Yeah. Because I was a publisher, I couldn't enter. I didn't have a publisher, technically. So I decided to post as a publisher, basically. I wrote to them. I said that, you know, we are the publisher of... So Ella you're an, in, you're an yeah. independent publishing house at this point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a whole big old one. <laughs> yeah, we have an author called Helen Habila who would like to send you his manuscript. You know, he's one of our best authors. Again, no email. So all this is, this is letters. I had an email now. Okay. I, I made up an email address. That was my first email address. <laughs> so I dhl the copies of the book to London and sent an email with my email address and they replied, yeah. But at this time, because there's always this conversation around who appreciates you, especially when you are a creative out of Africa. And sometimes you're so beaten by your immediate environment, you don't value your work. I think in the early stages, everyone goes through this, whether it's, you know, you're becoming, you know, because turning yourself into a career writer is a profession and there's, you know, an element of entrepreneurship that, that goes with that. What inspired you to go, I might not be getting the praise here, but I think I've got what it takes to enter this competition. I think, you know, there was naivete. I was young, <laughs> you know. I was young and hopeful, and I didn't know what an enormous risk I was taking, you know, going into it like that without any model. The only models, you know, were those authors who had published, people like Chinua Achebe, Ole Shawinka, but they, they were like a whole generation removed from us. Their rea reality was different. And they were mystical beings, really. Yeah, basically, you know, they were like unicorns or something. But... I guess I was lucky because I had good professors, I had friends, I had this community, and we lived in this bubble. We actually believed that, you know, what we're doing mattered. And we believed that we were this generation that was going to make a difference. And we were almost living in this romantic bubble. We really believed in literature so much and its ability to create change and to shift you know, a whole culture. You say we believed, though. You don't think that you were able to, to do that or have been able to contribute to that? Well, I'm just talking about our state of mind at the time. That's why I'm talking in the past tense okay. uh, at that time. Yeah, so, so we believe that. 
we, we, we were just living for that. And we believed in it so much that we could almost feel it. We knew it was just a matter of time before it happened. We had no doubt. It was partly because of our youth, inexperience, but also our passion for literature and for our country. Did that community make a difference for you in keeping the fire burning? Oh, yeah. They have been everything and they are still everything. Um, we've, we've remained in touch. And this is a very sad generation. We call it, you know, our, this is the third generation of African writing, or Nigerian writers. Why do I say sad? Because almost all of us, almost to a person, are now living outside the country. We basically had to leave the country because we couldn't become the kind of writers who wanted to be in, the, in Nigeria. The anti-intellectual culture that the military dictators nurtured was still in existence. Um, it systematically kind of pushed all of us outside to, to leave the country. So people, you know, went abroad to become writers, you know, to study, to become professors, and all of us are just scattered. In a way, it's a good thing. It's a good thing for literature. It's good to travel. It's good to leave your country sometimes. But it's also sad because you are not in the country contributing and nurturing, you know, younger writers. So that's basically what happened to that generation of writers. But yeah, to go back to my story, send my story for the Kane Prize. And I was shortlisted, five shortlistees from all over Africa. I was one of them. And yeah, so that's how I won the Kane Prize. They wrote to me and say, yeah. They wrote on that email address to say that, you know, your author has been shortlisted. So I replied, you know, yeah, yeah, who, who tell, who tell Helen Habila? He'll be, he'll be happy. <laughs> and so that happens for you. And at this point, you're, you're seeing the world a little differently. Yeah, possibilities. So I, I won the Ken Prize. I got a book contract in England and we decided to publish the book with a different title now, because technically it's still unpublished. It's just self-published in Nigeria. So they took it and I had to make a few changes with the editors and added a few more chapters. And that's what became my first novel, Waiting for an Angel. Incredible. And so oftentimes when people feel as though they've put out work, right? Maybe 50 people have seen it. And then an opportunity comes along and you're, you're in a much bigger stage. And then all of a sudden there's this pressure to create something else, create something new. Why didn't you do that though? Why go back to prison stories and then prison stories becomes Waiting for an Angel? The, the publisher wanted to publish it. They, they they read it. They liked it. It was a good book. And like I said, again, technically it hasn't been published. It hasn't been distributed. You know, it hasn't been signed to any publisher. And they they felt that it would be good to, to get a wider readership for it because it's the kind of book they will want it. So that we went ahead with it with my agent. Did you feel as though at the time, though, oh, I could give you something else? Like when they said, oh, would love to publish this book, did you feel like, oh, I could change it or I could do something else to it? Or actually, you're just happy to have the book reach more, reach more people as it was? I wanted it published. I wanted it distributed. I wanted it read. It's basically everything I wanted to do at the time. Everything I wanted to say at the time was in that book. I just felt like I was speaking for my generation, speaking for the political situation at that time. And here's Penguin you know, offering to publish it and distribute it to the whole world. So that was a writer's dream come true. And of course, I didn't have a novel, another novel apart from it at that time. That was my first book, my only book. You mentioned luck earlier on, and not to hang on to it too much, but oftentimes people say, you know, I was lucky. But when you talk about your journey and how, how much you have, if you think about the time spent on becoming a writer, right? How much you consumed versus how much you learned, practiced, etc. How much luck is there really? Or how much luck would you say there has been in your journey? You know, you've been the first African writing fellow at University of East Anglia. You, you know, you've been the first, you've done many firsts, first Chini Achebe fellow. M many firsts have come from or have been part of your journey. When you say luck, do you believe that you've made some of that luck? I guess so. Yeah, you know what they say, that luck is, you know, 70% hard work. <laughs> By luck, I mean, you just have to, pre you have to be ready. You could be a lucky person, it's good. But if you're not prepared, if you haven't done the groundwork, then luck becomes meaningless. I mean, you could be lucky to get a job, but can you do the job if you haven't prepared, you know, for that job? So, yeah, I guess when I say luck, I mean, there were people like me at the time, friends of mine who were as talented as me, who were as hungry who are as, you know, in the same place and time 
experiencing the same thing, but it didn't happen to them. It happened to me. So in a way, that's why I would say I, I was lucky. But it's also a way of seeing, I, I could see it. I could see what I wanted to be and I could see how to get there. It was There was a kind of clarity for me at the time. So in a way, it, it helped. Maybe they couldn't see it the way I could see it. I remember when I was coming to London, when my book was shortlisted for the Kane Prize, and some of my friends were telling me, you know, you should be careful, don't raise your hopes too high, because it doesn't really work out. So just be careful and don't get heartbroken. But I knew if your work is good, you will get a chance. I had no doubt, but they couldn't see it. So in a way, we had this difference of outlook. You know, you just hit on something that I want to talk to you about, because there's one thing to be a writer, a Black writer, an African writer. It, it feels like there are all these boxes and you are very clear in and in the fact that for you, it's about the quality of the work. And I love that you just touched on that, because I, I think there is a being a Black writer or being a Black African writer, the definition or, or the box that that represents you know, everyone talks about limiting beliefs in a very literal way. But the reality of what you're saying is it didn't matter who wrote the work. These prizes are there to be objective. Exactly. And I knew, you know, my work was as good as any others, you know. And if I could just continue improving myself and doing my best. And there was, you know, in, in a way, it's, I was also being naive because when I look back, I wonder if I could do the same thing now. Ignorance knowing is what bliss. I know. <laughs> Ignorance, Ignorance is bliss. bliss. You know, <laughs> because uh, the odds against me were so, so big. And this was a time when there were no agents, you know. No African writer was getting published anywhere outside Africa. You know, I was like literally the first person after the first generation of writers, you know, like... Yeah, Chino Achebe, Wallenshenka, to, to yeah, get, that, your, that was, that to get an first, international yeah. publication. Yeah, basically the first. But the good thing is that there was also a hunger because there was this long silence from African writers. So they wanted new voices. So after people like Gambuzo Marachera and Tisi Dangarengba, who are kind of closer to my age, even though they're, they're kind of 10 years older or so, but they were like the last time. Yeah, there was know, a law. Writer, yeah, there was a law. So the African Writer series that used to publish African writers had collapsed. They were no longer publishing. So there were no new African writing coming out. The model itself that used to create the pipeline for African writers had collapsed. The Heinemann African Writer Series was not publishing. So we need a new model now. And that was, I guess, what my book kind of ushered in. So when I say new model now, is working with an agent, not just with a publisher, but with an agent who would go through the traditional process of taking your manuscript, working on it with you, marketing it for you and giving you advice and then getting you published. And I was also lucky. Sorry, I keep coming back to the No, no, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. go. No, but that's why I asked you the question, because... I wonder if, if we say that to be modest. I guess in a way, one is to be modest, say luck. Because, you know, there are people, like I said again, there are people more talented, more hungry, who just couldn't get there. So it's there has to be, I guess, something, if you believe in that, the uncanny, something out there. But were they entering for these prizes? Yeah, some of them were entering. Some of them weren't. <laughs> yeah. But you know what I mean? Like when we talk about luck, sometimes it's like time and place. What decisions did you make to arrive there? And oftentimes, if you plotted the journey, is the luck because you gave yourself more chances to be heard and seen? I guess so. I knew when I was in Lagos, I was writing. I knew I had to do something drastic. I had to change my life. I had to change my life. I literally was writing that novel. You know, I wrote my novel with candlelight, without electricity, because we didn't have electricity. The transformer in my neighborhood kind of blew. So there was no... Nepa, basically Nepa was there. We didn't have electricity for four months. And that was when I was writing my novel in the night for four months. In Longhand, I didn't have a computer. So I knew I had to do that. I had to change my life in that way. No going out to party with my friends at night. I had to. It was a make or break moment. So you could say that was a way of creating my own luck. That realization that I had to do something drastic. If I want to move to the next step, I had to do that. I had to give it everything. So that was basically what I did to write that novel. And so that opens the world for you? That opened the doors. I got the Kane Prize. I got invited to University of East Anglia to literally within the same year, to come and do the fellowship. Um, they gave me the Shivening Scholarship. And then PhD? Yeah, University of East Anglia after my fellowship. So Dr. Helen? No, I didn't finish my PhD. Okay, why? So I was doing my PhD 
Before I finish, I was invited by Chino Achebe to come to the U.S. to teach at Bard College. After that, I got my job at where I am now, George Mason University, to teach creative writing. And the PhD kind of receded into the background more and more and more, and there was just no need for me to do it. Because oftentimes the question is, why does someone pursue a PhD? Yeah. Let me tell you a conversation I had with Chino Achebe. You're doing a PhD, he said. I said, yeah. I said, why? <laughs> that was his question. Why do you, Why are you doing a PhD? I was in your time. Just write. Just go to the next book. You don't have to read what others have written. They will read what you have written and do their PhDs on it. Don't waste your time. Just, just write your art. Do your books. You'll be fine. I took that to heart. And I kind of lost interest in the PhD. Because oftentimes there's, there's a level of validation that we seek. But that validation always isn't necessarily where you should be. Yeah. There's, especially in America, there's so much emphasis on this paper qualification. Literally, almost everybody I know has a PhD. That's the way the system works. It's very competitive. And regardless of what you have written or what you have achieved, they also want to see that qualification. But again, I was lucky. I didn't need to, to have a PhD to get <laughs> Again, <my job>. I was <laughs> lucky. <laughs> I was lucky. <laughs> but I, I think... What is clear is in your journey is it, for you, it's always been, there's a huge part of gut to your choices. And it, it seems that you, you've you always had a clear vision of, of what you wanted out of this career and, and this thing that you love, which is storytelling. I wanted to talk a little bit more about, I guess, the power of using your voice, especially in today's world where social media is a thing. We have masterclasses upon masterclasses of people, you know, wanting to be writers and authors and poets. And I guess as someone who is in academia, who is helping to mold the generation of creative writers, and also someone who is a real life practitioner in the field, what would you say is the power in you, in owning your own voice today? Loaded question. Yeah, very loaded, loaded question. Loaded, sorry. I, I love to give loaded questions. <laughs> <laughs> I guess the benefit of the podcast is I can load the questions. <laughs> yeah, to own your voice is to know where you're coming from, to know your own stories. So imagine there's this analogy I always give about what it means to be a writer. You're as good as any other writer, white, green, whatever color they are. This analogy in this book by E.M. Foster, the British author. The book is called Aspects of the Novel. So he has this example of writers writing, writers from different generations. So imagine a room with Wally Shoinka sitting next to Shakespeare, sitting next to Charles Dickens, all of them facing a blank sheet of paper, just trying to write the next book. It doesn't matter who you are, white or black, you're as good as the person next to you. They just happen to have come earlier than you, and maybe because of some cultural thing, their books have been marketed more than yours, but believe yourself to be as good as any writer sitting next to you. So you're all there in that room and you're just trying to write the next book. So you're as good as any other writer, believe that. Then you have to decide what culture am I coming from? So two things. First is you're as good as them, but then you have to narrow your, your field. You're writing within a particular culture that made you. So you have to read all the books written by people in your culture. So you have to read all the African authors that came before you because that's who you are. After reading every author, you focus on your own and then you try to innovate. You know, how do I go beyond? How do I build on what they have done? And then you really begin to kind of define that field of writing. So you're, you're speaking in your own voice and their own voice and echoing what they have done, but carrying it further and telling the world your story. Now we're owning your story by understanding it very, very well and having the confidence that you're as good as any other person. A question for you, which is who, who do you write for? Who do I write for? I know this might sound a bit corny that I write for myself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure every author you've asked that question must have told you the same thing. I write for myself. And there's a kind of truth in that. There's a kind of confidence in that because I believe that I know what literature means. I know what good literature means. And I know what a good story is. And so when I say I'm writing for myself, it's because I know I like good books and I want the best books. And since I cannot get those books, I have to write them myself. So I'm writing for myself because I have a standard that I need to meet. And I have to produce it myself. So I'm always kind of pushing. And I'm always improving in my taste, in my understanding of the world. And that's why I have to keep getting better and better as an author. 
So I'm, I keep writing for the person that I'm going to be tomorrow, that I'm going to become because I'm always growing. So my craft has to grow. Amazing. Speaking of that, and I guess the reason why I asked who you write for is because there was a gap between the book in 2019 and your book before that. Yeah, the book before that was Oil and Water. Yeah, that was almost, yeah, almost six years or so. Yeah. But I had done other things in between. Yeah. And I guess the question I was going to ask was around the pace. You know, the world is fast now. The pace is unrelenting. And it seems as you progress in your writing, you seem to be pacing yourself a little bit more. Is that intentional or is that because you're you're then going off and through the academia, through the different reviews and things like that? Is that because you're enjoying di- like just exploring other versions of what this career looks like for you? I, I wish it were as simple and as deliberate as that. It's not that I was adjusting to being in a new place to live in my country, to trying to create a new home in a new place. So I had left England, moved to America, totally different from everything I knew. No family, no friends. It's something that you take some adjusting. I I was trying to be a professor in an American university and trying to write at the same time, trying to be a father and a husband. And it takes a lot of toll and it kills creativity. So it was really a struggle. It was a fight. It took time. And people don't understand what it means to be in a new place. You basically have to reinvent yourself. It's like the person you used to be has died and you have to create this new person. Some people make it. Some people actually stop producing. You know, some people basically cannot cope. So for me, it took that time to readjust. You know, what kind of writer do I want to be? Do I still write about Nigeria? Do I write about America? What is it? You know, so I had to, you know. Yeah, you have to then play with your identity. Rediscover myself. Yeah. Yeah, incredible. Last question is around COVID, which has been an incredible 12 months and and counting for most of the world. And I guess what that looks like for writers, creatives, when they're starved so much of of the food that that they need to, to consume, have you been able to find ways of staying inspired and creative through the pandemic? And if so, Do you mind sharing some of those with with the audience? Yeah, it wasn't easy at first. Um, The first year, the first few months, you know, being at home, um, it was so new. Here we are in this uncharted space, teaching from home, you know, going to festivals on Zoom and trying to be creative and knowing all the time that you could go step out the door and never come back and die from COVID. You know, there's this thing that's waiting outside to kill you. It's so hard to be. <laughs> you can't <laughs> ignore it and go, you know what? I'm, I'm exactly. creative today. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Because I could just end up dead tomorrow. So what's the point of creating? So there was that. And there's also the lack of contact with your readers. Before now, one could go to festivals and meet readers and get feedback and get to talk about your writing. And you come back inspired and really hungry to write some more because you've met your friends and other writers and they inspire you. Writing is this kind of incestuous thing. Writers inspire other writers and books inspire books. So the only thing I did, I think, to keep my inspiration and my creativity going was to read a lot. Even though I couldn't write, I couldn't be creative, I was reading and reading and reading. And gradually, you know, when things began to make more sense, I started to write. And one thing too that's always helped me is I do more than one thing. I write in more than one genre. So I write reviews, I write nonfiction, and I also teach. Teaching is a kind of creativity too. You know, some of the outlets for me are always there, even if I'm not writing fiction. I write poetry for myself sometimes. So these things kind of kept me going. And then finally this year, I'm able to start writing fully. Thank you so much for being so candid. Where can people find you? Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, I'm there. Your website? My website too, helonhabila.com. Well, thank you so much, Helen, for joining us in this week's episode. I feel so zen after this episode. Normally I'm like supercharged, but you have such a calming energy. Please pick up Helen's, I guess, some of the books that he's mentioned, if you can. Um, They're available on every possible platform that you can think of. Um, And thank you. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Third Culture Africans. We are building a community of leaders and game changers and would love you to join in the conversation on thirdcultureafricans.com. Subscribe for news, for tips and more useful resources on today's topic and more episodes to ignite and inspire your entrepreneurial journey. Carry on the conversation 
on Facebook and Instagram at Third Culture Africans. Your ratings and reviews are important to us, so please leave one on your favorite streaming platform and help us amplify our voices. Until next time, you are valid, you are strong, and you are just getting started.